Welcome to Conversations on Leadership of KLDR Online Leadership Development Radio. We are here with a special guest, Dr. William Attaway from Catalytic Leadership. And I wanted to go ahead and get you to introduce yourself to our listeners and give them just a little bit of your background. Sure, Dave. Hey, thanks for having me on today. It's a joy to be with you. Uh, I have served in leadership now for nearly three decades, uh, most recently as the lead pastor of a church in Northern Virginia for the last 17 plus years. Uh, What I have done during my leadership journey is learn as much as I can about leadership and begin to invest and pour that into as many other leaders as I can. And that's why I started Catalytic Leadership, my company that's focused on developing and training leaders, because I want to see them benefit from as much leadership development and training as possible, because I believe when a leader gets better, everybody benefits. Everybody gets better. Absolutely. So with that, I always like to lead off with this question. It's a little bit of a loaded question, but what does leadership mean to you and what does good leadership look like? Mm. You know, I'll answer that with a little bit of a story, Dave. Uh, okay. When, when I went to college, I went as a pharmacy major, and my intent was to, to pursue that track of study. Uh, I got to inorganic and organic chemistry and decided quickly that this was not for me. <laughs> but so so you figured looking at it from the outside, like just counting the pills wasn't that hard. Like I get 13, 14, Absolutely. 15. I'm good with that, right? <laughs> I can count. That, I'm there, right? <laughs> Fortunately, it's a little more complicated. Just <laughs> so, a wee bit. As I got into those those subjects, I, I said, "Hey, I think I think I'm wired differently than this." Um, but one of the things that I learned, and, and I've learned so many times over my life journey, is that there is no such thing as a wasted experience, right? And, and so, during that season, I was I was introduced to the concept of a catalyst, and a catalyst is simply something that that sparks or accelerates right? A, a process, a chemical process, a significant change. And as I have developed and, and grown as a leader and helped others to do the same, what I've discovered is what I call catalytic leadership. And that's a leader who sparks or accelerates significant change or action that has a powerful impact. And so to me, that is leadership. I, I love how John Maxwell puts it, that, that leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. And, and that's so true. I think that influence can be used for good or for bad. And, and what I want to do is help leaders make a significant impact in their team, in their organization, and in their own self-leadership. And that's what catalytic leadership is all about. Nice, nice, nice. So if you had to paint a picture of good leadership, because you mentioned with Maxwell's definition that you could use that influence for good or for bad, what does good leadership look like to you? Hmm. I think good leadership looks like a leader that is leading for the benefit of other people, not themselves. Uh, A good leader is focused on accomplishing a vision or a mission that benefits more than just them. Uh, A self-focused leader is, is, well, that's not good leadership, right? Uh, A really good, in, in my term, a catalytic leader is one that's focused on other people and using the resources that they have, whether those are financial resources or people resources for the benefit of as many other people as possible. There's so many components to that, of course. And that's one of the reasons why in my journey of of leading and coaching other leaders, I've developed a process, 12 keys that are the components of catalytic leadership. Like if you're going to break this down, what are the 12 keys that I return to time and time and time again as I'm teaching and leading and coaching leaders? Uh, and so those are the components that really make up what a good catalytic leader is. Good deal. Good deal. Well, I have always been known to be a sucker, so I will take the bait. <laughs> Please, Dr. Adelaide, what are the 12 components of being a catalytic leader? I have to know. Well, I tried to walk you right into that, Dave. So oh, exactly. And then you did. You opened the door and I walked right through. There you go. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Happy New Year. Exactly. Uh, these, are, these are outlined in a new book that I've got coming out in January called Catalytic Leadership. Uh, on January 25th, we're launching that. Uh, the first of those, I think, is critical. The first key. And, and that is cultivating a teachable spirit. Uh, I'm sure you, like myself, we have encountered leaders who do not have that, who, who know it all and are, have no problem communicating that they know it all, right? Correct. And, and those and, are the ones that you know right off the bat, you are not doing business with them. 
<laughs> exactly. That's, that is not what I would define as catalytic, right? No. They're not going to make a significant impact. Uh, a teachable spirit is a non-negotiable for leadership, right? This is what Jim Collins talks about in his book, Good to Great, right? The humility of a great level five leader. Uh, that, that's critical, that constant learning posture. And that is a key element, I believe, to being a catalytic leader. You're constantly learning. You're constantly seeking to learn from other people. I believe and have taught for many years that you can learn from anybody. Sometimes you might learn what not to do, but that can be incredibly valuable, right? I am a huge fan and I do in our <laughs> workshops as well. You know, it's how to communicate with Bill, how to communicate with Sue. That's awesome. But more importantly, how not to, you know, that. Yes, there's a whole lot that goes into the what not to do. Yes. So that's, think, that's the first. That's okay. the first key is, is cultivating a teachable spirit. Uh, second is discovering your wiring. And that is uh, every one of us is created and designed specifically. We have different strengths. We have different talents, different passions. We, we have different temperaments. And, and discovering how you are uniquely wired as a leader will help you lead others more effectively, more efficiently in a more catalytic way. Now, of course, the next step to that is learning how your team is wired, right? And God learning forbid. how you can lead <laughs> them well. And you know, it happens that I know somebody who focuses on that specific thing, Dave. Uh, well, do tell. <laughs> well, <that's you. laughs> I've, I've heard of those once or twice, but you know, I'm, uh, <laughs> it, it sounds vaguely familiar. I'll put it that way. <laughs> it does sound vaguely familiar, knowing about you and your team and being able to communicate effectively with them. Yes. I think the work you do keys right into that. I think that's part of discovering your wiring and the wiring of your team. Absolutely. It helps you to lead effectively, not just your team, but your whole organization. Right. And as you're interacting with clients or with customers, it helps you to lead them as well. No, I agree with that 100 percent. No, you're absolutely right. That's why we always start out working in that component with with teams and companies, just because I firmly believe you could do all the leadership development, all the leadership teaching you want, teach all the classes, trainings, workshops you want. If your senior leadership team isn't communicating amongst themselves effectively, it's all for naught. Absolutely. Absolutely. The third key, actively pursuing intentional growth. Um, growth doesn't just happen. You're not going to grow as a leader. You're not going to wake up one day and say, wow, I'm a fully developed, mature leader. How did that happen? I didn't mean for that to happen. Well, what, what, I don't, wow, look at this. It's not how it works. You have to be intentional. And this is a key word for so much of what I do and how I teach and coach leaders. Intentionality matters. And so when it comes to your own personal growth, this is beyond just having a teachable posture. This is beyond the, the first key. This is now saying, I'm going to develop a plan that is going to help me intentionally grow. What am I going to put into my life, right? What books am I going to read? What conferences am I going to attend? What podcasts am I going to listen to, right? What am I going to put on the input side to help me to intentionally grow as a leader? And to you mean somebody that. just doesn't plant you like an acorn somewhere and then, you know, 20 <laughs> years later, you're this, you know, mature oak CEO, you know, uh, you know, in charge I mean, you of can thousands of people. <laughs> you can try that. I've never seen it work, but, hey, <laughs> you know. <laughs> oh, my God. What's next? Next, I would say is to be boldly action oriented. Right. And that's the fourth key. And, and this is this is key. Most leaders are going to have a bias for action. Most leaders are going to be definitely focused on the, the charge in the next mountain, right? Taking the next hill for sure. But I think there's there's a key intentional element here that I'm going to be bold, right? I'm not going to just be passive and react to what's going on. No, I'm going to be proactive. I'm going to think forward. I'm going to ask the questions that are going to help me think ahead on the action oriented side of the equation. Right? Nice. Fifth key is evaluating ruthlessly, right? And boy, <laughs> that's so important. Where I lead, we evaluate all the time. Uh, and, and that we use a model that, that I heard from a guy named Andy Stanley years ago. Uh, and that is, we ask three questions. What went right? What went wrong? And how do we make it better the next time we do this? 
Uh, that model of evaluation is one key of this, but really evaluating ruthlessly applies to me as a leader, my own leadership journey. When I'm reflecting, I sit and think, hey, how did I lead in this particular situation, in this particular conversation, in this context? Well, we're right. What do I want to do next time? Right. Well, we're wrong. What do I not want to do next time? Yeah, and exactly. How am I going to do this better in the future? Um, the right. next one is, is to be family focused. And that's a choice that you have. Right. And if you have a family, if you have a spouse, if you have kids to choose to be family focused, uh, that's something that a lot of leaders have not gotten right. And we've seen the results of that. They've sacrificed their family on the altar of their career. Right. And, and that is not a good trade. Right. No. My, my goal and, and I know your goal is for those who know you best. Right. To respect you most. Yes. And I think I think the key here is is making that an intentional choice. And that's why I put this in as part of being a catalytic leader. Well, if you sacrifice the family, like I said, when you get old, the um, yes, you can pay somebody to come cut the grass versus having the grandkids come over and cut the grass. But uh, um, the guy running Robbie's lawn service isn't going to come over for Thanksgiving. Sorry. No, and Christmas dinner. No, no, not typically. And I'll tell you, I've spent I've spent <laughs> a lot of time with people at the end of their lives is as part of, of my vocation. And I've never heard anybody at that point in their life say, I wish I had spent more time at the office. You yeah, know, not I've never heard much. anybody say, I, I wish I had accomplished more of my KPIs. <laughs> yeah, no, not um, so much. You know, what else those, you got? That focuses on relationship. And so that's why that matters so much. Um, the seventh is to aspire for proper productivity, right? Pro I've been a student of productivity for most of my life. Uh, I was one of those kids in, in high school who had a day timer, if you remember what those were back in the oh, day. Oh, yes. <laughs> they were made out of these things called paper, right? Paper, right? It's fascinating. Inside this nice <laughs> binder, it was great. <laughs> productivity matters. Um, but proper productivity is the key here, right? Right. Uh, Becoming more efficient is great, but you're never going to become more efficient if you're not focusing on doing the right things. Yep. I can be very busy and yep. not accomplish what needs to be accomplished. Yeah, let's just say effectiveness is, a, is quite important, uh, not just, just efficient. A bit. Just a little bit. All right, a couple minutes we have left. Let's get a couple more knocked out and then we we'll, uh, might finish yeah. the rest during the break. So, yeah, uh, after the break. So, so what do we got next? Next, build up people and teams. People are your greatest resource, right? That's what we always yes. say. But actually, the right people are your greatest resource. And I think that is that is key here. So this is about investing in people, helping them to grow and develop how they are wired, and building your team in such a way that is healthy, um, not just productive. Very true. Very true. All right, what else? Next, never stop leading change. Ever. There's never a point at which a leader can say, oh, we're good. We don't ever need to change anything else ever. No. Change is a part of leadership. Uh, you've heard it said, I've heard it said that nobody likes change except for a wet baby, right? Or maybe the person whose uh, change, it was their idea, right? Yeah. yeah here's, here's the thing about change. Change is a constant. And if we've learned nothing over the last couple of years, it, <clears throat> it's how change never stops, no matter yeah. how much you want it to. So, Leaders, no. we can choose to be reactive and just react to the change around us, or we can be proactive and never stop leading in that. Yep. Or you can always just call it lean process improvement. You know, it's, it's exactly. always let's say just Toyota production system. It's always just something. But you're absolutely right. There's always a better way to do it. But there's yeah. always, like I said, the changes are going to happen. It's just a matter of do you want to be uh, the one riding the wave or do you want to be the one that just got swallowed by the wave? Um, on there. So which number was that? Never stop leading change number nine. Number nine. All right. Well, let's get to 10, 11, and 12. When we come back, we've got a few seconds before the break, but with that, I'll get you to go through and just list off the ones that you went through for real quick. And then we'll get into the next ones. And we will be back from our break in just a few minutes here on KLDR Online Leadership Development Radio on Conversations on Leadership with Dr. Dave. So see you in a bit. Welcome back to Conversations on Leadership with Dr. Dave here on KLDR Online Radio. We have a special guest today, Dr. William Attaway from Catalytic Leadership. And in our last segment, we were talking about 
the 12 different points that make up catalytic leadership. And I believe we were at number nine. If you want to go through the ones that you already went through over the last break, just list them out real quick and then get into the next one. That would be great. We will finish that up. Sure, Dave. Uh, we started with cultivating a teachable spirit, right? We moved into discovering your wiring, actively pursuing intentional growth, being boldly action oriented, choosing to be family focused, evaluating ruthlessly, aspiring for proper productivity, building up people and teams, and never stop leading change, right? So the 10th key of catalytic leadership is to prioritize clear communication. Now, any leader will understand this one, right? Because we communicate all the time. It's what we do. We communicate with, with our team. We communicate with our direct reports. We communicate with customers or clients. And, and that's, that's so important. Like we are constantly communicating, but is it clear? When people mm. walk away from communicating with us, do they walk away understanding what we were saying, what we were trying to communicate, or are they walking away with something else? Is it fuzzy? And that's why clear communication matters and is a part of a catalytic leader. The 11th key is developing other leaders. Now, we've talked about building teams, right? Building up people and teams, but this is intentionally saying, I'm going to develop not just the people on my team, but I'm going to develop leaders, right? I think the job of a leader is to give away their leadership, what they have learned, what they have benefited from, to give that away, right? I never want to hold that back. I want to develop as many other leaders as I can, because when you develop a leader, you are influencing not just that leader, but all the people they will lead going forward. Yes. I love the analogy of uh, being a river, not a reservoir. Yes. Um, yes, exactly. Yeah. Right. Right. I mean, you you know, and, and thinking about the analogy for those who hadn't heard it, a lot of, you know, you, I can take in, take in, take in all I want. And eventually I can only take in, but so much if I'm not giving away, if I'm constantly giving, 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 and not taking in, I'm going to run dry. I mean, you're going to burn out and you're not going to, you know, but having that, what you're taking in, you're, it just flows through. And that developing other leaders is really where that multiplication effect comes into. It's not just a linear addition, like I'm, I'm developing additional team members. That's where, like I said, it really starts multiplying across the organization. So I like that. Absolutely. It's, it's about being a conduit. Like you said, you know, I'm not just going to take everything that's, that, that I've learned and everything that I've experienced. It's not just for me. It's for the benefit of those around me. Yeah. I love that. So that's the 11th, developing other leaders. The 12th last key is leading yourself well. <laughs> Boy, I'm the <laughs> hardest person to lead. Yes. And I think every leader would say that, right? We are the hardest person to lead. And yet, if we don't lead ourselves well, we will find that our leadership journey will be cut short. Yes. And I would definitely say it has intensified over the last couple of years, but I would say even yes. look at the last five years, maybe 10 years with social media, I would say since 2010 and beyond people's lack of a better term, BS meter is highly attuned. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Absolutely. so they understand inauthenticity. And so when you're inauthentic and you're telling them one thing and doing something else, because you're not leading yourself well, yeah. they pick up on that very quickly. And I haven't seen much to undermine somebody's leadership than that. Yep. That's exactly right. So I was going to say that is one of those killers of employee engagement it is a killer of motivation. There's so many ripple trickle down effects that ripple out from that. Uh, I, I love joking about when you come in and you see the platitudes on the wall, you see the vision, mission, values, blah, 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 blah. And then you go through orientation and, you know, of course you, you know, get that again. And this is what we believe in. And then as soon as you get out of your day long or, or a couple of days worth of onboarding, and then you get out to the floor, you get out where you at you were going to be. Now, all of a sudden it's, wait a minute, what my boss is saying has nothing to do with those things up on that wall. <laughs> and, uh, or, Hey, sounds good. But when the rubber meets the road, this cat ain't jiving. This is not, mm -mm, no, 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 no. Exactly. That is say one thing, do another. Guaranteed, you're gonna have a, either high turnover or you're gonna have folks that are um, 
even if you're in a right to work state and you don't like we are in Virginia and you don't have union contracts, you would have something that's a, there's a non-union employment contract. I call the unholy contract, right? Mm. Have you heard of the unholy contract? No, I haven't. Okay. Unholy contract is this, you know, it's, um, I work just hard enough not to get fired and you pay me just enough not to quit. Wow. Wow. I come in, I, if I'm there at nine, I punch it at nine, maybe nine or two. And I am ready to go at 4.55 and brother at five o'clock, I am punched out and gone. Mm. As John Maxwell says, I got the running shoes on at, at 4.55, ready to go. And at five o'clock, I'm punched out and go. Like I said, I, you pay me just enough not to quit and I work just hard enough not to get fired. That's the unholy employment contract. And that is not how I want to live. But how many people are in that because they're, yeah. they're disengaged and they work yeah. for, like, I need the job but they work for poor leadership and yeah. they feel like they're put into that spot to where, why do I want to give one extra iota to this company, to this person, to the whatever? I mean, I can't blame them. I'm not faulting them. It's more of a survival mechanism, you know? Yeah. So, absolutely. I mean, but that doesn't help as a leader, that doesn't help you. That doesn't help your organization. That doesn't help your growth. That doesn't help your team, mm -hmm. but and it, unfortunately, uh, with poor leadership, what it devolves down to sometimes. Yeah, I agree. And uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Gallup, in their most recent uh, employment survey, mentioned that if you have a highly engaged employee, it could take at least 20, 25% to try to draw them away from mm -hmm. a company, where if they are actively disengaged, it you got an extra quarter an hour, I'm good, right? I mean, it takes nothing yeah, right. to pull them on, or just a different environment. I mean, anything. It takes nothing to to draw somebody away from an a company where they're act, where they're disengaged or actively disengaged. Where if they're highly engaged, it's going to cost you a little bit of coin to pull them away from them. Yeah, that's a good word. Cool. So our next question is: What is the biggest leadership challenge that you've had to face? Mm. I think I think the last uh, the last twenty one months would qualify. <laughs> <laughs> Come um, on, it was, it was only fifteen days, man. What are you talking about? That's what they said. It's the slowest spread, right? Fifteen days yeah. is slowest spread. That's the longest fifteen days, man. I got I need a new day timer, right? I still got that old one with, made out of paper, right? I don't know what happened. <laughs> I think this has been this has been one of the greatest, uh, one of the most difficult seasons that I've ever led through. Uh, and in talking with with other leaders, uh, I hear that a lot. I think that that there's two ways of looking at it when you're going through a difficult patch, uh, like we have been in these last 21 months. You know, off and on in different in different areas in different contexts. Um, you know, you can either look at it and say, "Boy, this has to pass eventually. We got to get back to normal. We got to get back to how things were. How fast can we get back to like it was?" And, and that's a perspective, right? Um, I'll tell you the perspective that I've had has been has been different. There's there's uh, Dr. Amy Edmondson at Harvard Business School uh, has talked about this pretty extensively, and I've got a quote from her that I keep on my monitor actually. Mm. Um, and this is what it says: Too many are asking whether we will go back to normal. To me, the problematic word is back. There is no going back to pre-COVID times. There is only forward to a new and uncertain future that is currently presenting us with an opportunity for thoughtful design. I got to tell you, when I heard that, and 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 nice. I, I said, I said that's key. Those last few words. This is an opportunity for thoughtful design. I have used that with our leadership teams, right in the organization where I lead, and I've talked about this. We have an opportunity to thoughtfully design what going forward is going to look like. How can we make this sustainable? How can we make this more healthy, right? How can we make this as leaders, an organization that we would choose to be a part of if we were walking in, right? What yeah. would we do? What would we do differently? We don't have to just go back to what we were doing previously. Well, how many times are people, no, how many times, and I love that, not necessarily going back. I understand the sentiment, but I, I yeah. love that quote on, but one of the things that really struck me about that is how many times over the last 
10, 15 years when you're in the kind of the talent development, leadership development, employment end of it, you know, people work life balance and, and remote work and, and, you know, flexible schedules and working and on and on and on and on. And you have a flurry of, let's just say less than confident managers and leaders that are like, Hey, if I don't see them, it's not getting done. So from a micromanaging standpoint, like they, if you're not in the office, it doesn't get done. So all of a sudden COVID hits and there's a lot of remote work and there's a lot of things you just physically cannot do remote. I failed to see somebody be able to start an IV and deliver medications over Zoom, right? I've yet to see somebody rewire a socket over Zoom, right? I mean, there's just there's certain, certain things, right? That just don't happen online. But for the vast majority of jobs, there are office jobs, knowledge work jobs, whatever you want to call it. And there is a possibility to do that. How much better has it been for people to actually, like you said, thoughtfully design, hey, wait a minute, we got through 2020. And if you come out the other end, by the skin of your teeth, there was still a check in the wind column, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. But you could say, well, how, you know, especially like where you're at in Northern Virginia, right? Well, wait a minute. I have staff that live a little ways away. So do I want them to commute five days a week or maybe come into the office twice a week? They're happier. Absolutely. You know, and just, uh, it's like you said, just being thoughtful on, hey, now that we have different tools and different ways of doing things, how can we best structure them to make it better for everybody? I love that. I think the key is looking forward, you know, not trying to get back to some idealized past. Yeah. It's always idealized in our minds, right? We only remember the great typically. Leave it to Beaver, we brother. Don't... Leave it to Beaver. That's right. I mean, exactly. it's we hold it up as this idealized thing. If we could only get back there, my job, my function as a leader is to help people look forward, yeah. right? To see what could be and what I believe should be and help to make that reality. Nice, nice, nice. Well, we have two minutes left in this segment and I want to get to our last question for the segment. What do you see as one of the biggest mistakes leaders make today? Mm. What, is, what do you see as one of the biggest mistakes leaders make today? You know, I think, I think one of the greatest mistakes I see again and again is not being intentional about your own growth, thinking that mm. it's just going to happen, thinking that you're just going to develop as a leader. You're just going to get better with more time in. And the problem with that is that, that experience doesn't make you better. <laughs> oh, and you mean there's a difference between being a 30 year man, being a 30 year leader and being a one year leader that you've done 30 times? Exactly, exactly it. Experience doesn't make you better. Evaluated experience does. Yeah. Right. How am I, well, how am I evaluating? How am I improving intentionally, choosing to improve, right, over what I did last time? I think that's a mistake I see again and again and again. Yeah, I, I love it's, it's funny you mentioned that because I always use that term when it comes to the realm of public speaking, because I mean, you could sure. and now granted, it, the more you do it, you you get experience, you have you, mm -hmm. I mean, there are advantages to that, even if it's just I have one year of experience that I've repeated over the last 20. There's right. still some advantage. That to that one year is going to be pretty in. good by then. <laughs> yeah, you, you dialed in that one year, right? Pretty good. But it's just like with public speaking, I laugh in the last few seconds we have on this one is that. You go to every Rotary group, every Kiwanis group, every Chamber group, or whatever, and you speak, and everyone's like, yay, and they're cheering or whatever. They're not, they may be, but they're not necessarily cheering because you did such a great job. They're cheering because they aren't the ones that have to be up there talking in front of 200 people, right? It's sort of like hot diggity, man. I am not, yes, better you than me, Jack. I am good with this. And so, but versus something like Toastmasters, where you do get, here's what you did good, here's what you could improve on, here's something to challenge yourself. And you, along with the structured system that you can, like you said, intentionally get better, that's a whole different ballgame. And so if you can take that type of Toastmasters example and structure it towards intentional leadership, I think that that would be a strong model to, to go with. Absolutely. Cool. Well, we, it is time for our break. So we will be back in just a few minutes on, with Conversations on Leadership with Dr. Dave here on KLDR Online Leadership Development Radio. See you in a few.
Welcome back to Conversations on Leadership with Dr. Dave here on KLDR, Online Leadership Development Radio. We are in our last segment with our special guest, Dr. William Attaway of Catalytic Leadership, and we've had some really good insights so far. We've had the 12 components that make up catalytic leadership. We've also talked about some of the biggest leadership challenges that we've had, which last couple of years have definitely fallen into that category and some of the mistakes that leaders make. But in this next segment, I wanted to start out with a question. What do you think is the best way for leaders to improve their leadership skills? I think the, the best way I have discovered for a leader to get better, to develop intentionally, is to have a coach. Uh, and I hmm. say that being a coach, so it sounds kind of self-serving, but I'll tell you that long before <laughs> I was a coach, I had a coach. And, and hmm. that's why I can say that with experience. I still have a coach. Uh, because I still see the value in this. What, what, what does a coach do? A coach helps you look forward, right? And think about where do you want to go? Where do you want to be as a leader? What are the specific things you need to develop in and focus in? And then they help you with accountability, with focus, with direction, with encouragement, all the things that you need to change. And so that's why I think coaching matters so much. That is why I think that is what a leader needs to get better. This is what I do for leaders. I help leaders by coaching them. And what I have discovered is that there's something really powerful in that one-on-one -on -one relationship. When you are, you have somebody who is for you, who is cheering you on, right? Who is saying, man, I want to see you thrive and grow. I want to see you intentionally get better. And, nice. and they're on your team. They're on team you. Uh, man, how is that not going to help you get better? Of course it will. I've seen it too many times again and again. So I think that's how leaders can intentionally choose to take a step in this. Nice, nice, nice. Well, flush that out a little bit more because I'm just kind of curious on, especially like taking the 12 components of catalytic leadership, how would you take those 12 and take that into coaching somebody uh, a leader or manager or an aspiring leader or a CEO or somebody like that? How would you like merge those two between the book and what you were just talking about? Sure. I think the book is the beginning of the conversation. I think the book is, is this is what it is. Now, information doesn't bring transformation, does it? Right? Oh, come on. Really? <laughs> if it did, I mean, now we've got the biggest transformation device in our pockets. That's uh, it. No right. demand, you know? <laughs> Come information on. alone does not bring transformation. Oh, you mean I just because I know that I need to eat less and exercise more, I'm not going to drop 100 pounds? Bingo. Bingo. Blast That's for me. What a great example, right? Blast for me. <laughs> Blast for me, I said. <laughs> Sack Especially, after the, holidays. Holidays. Especially yes. after the holidays. We really shouldn't talk about that, right? <laughs> <laughs> or maybe we really should be if you're a health coach. <laughs> there, well, there you go. If we want to help people, that's right. Help them get better. Um, I, I think I think information is helpful. And that the book is going to provide information, but it's not the key to success, right? The key to success is application, right? How am I going to take the information and apply it specifically in my context, in my leadership journey based on my wiring, and you're not going to get all that from a book. <laughs> it's just oh, so I'm going to get this on on record now. So I formally have an author mm -hmm. telling us on film and on audio <laughs> that his book or her book is not the end all be all to save the world. Okay, <laughs> it is not. It is absolutely not. <laughs> Let's be clear. <laughs> I just wanted to get that on record, right? It was like, hey, buy my book, and it's amazing, and it's you know, it's it, it dices, it slices, it julians, it it'll cure cancer, it's and the gout, right? It's the cure for all your leadership ills. It was like you're like, ah, yeah, no, not so much. <laughs> I mean, I hope it's helpful. I do. I spend a lot of time. But I, I'm I think, joking I aside. It's the app. I don't know what you mean. It's the application of it. That's without the application, it's simply another book on your shelf. How many of us have been to conferences or workshops or seminars? We take notes dutifully through the sessions, and those notes are wonderfully preserved in a binder or a notebook on our shelf. We have the information. We simply never did anything with it. And that, I think, is the key. 
Like the key is application. That's where, that's where coaching comes in. That's where I think the next step can be for so many leaders to say, I want to take this information. And I want to begin to apply it. So what I do when in, in, in a one-on-one coaching relationship with a client is I help them f- discover what their five primary focus areas are going to be. What are the five areas where they really want to grow over a specific period of time, whether it's six months, a year, 18 months, whatever. I want to make movement in these five areas, right? And what I find so often is that those five areas are typically found in the 12 keys of catalytic leadership. Mm. Um, those, those encompass almost invariably the things people want to see movement on. And so those are the areas we're going to focus on. Like that sets the, that sets the agenda going forward for our coaching discussions. Right. Let's talk about this. You want to see movement in this. You want to see the ball move up the field on this. Great. That's wonderful. Let's do that. Right. Let's talk about it. And that's where coaching comes in. It's like, how are we going to get this done? Exactly. Exactly. Nice. 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 Well, the uh, we've got some time left and I wanted to kind of double back on a few things. But first, um, at, tell the listeners how they can connect with you and get your book. All the all the kind of that good stuff. Let's touch on that, and then we'll remind them at the very end. But uh, tell folks how they can get in touch with you uh, or connect. Sure, the easiest way is uh, through the website catalyticleadership.net. Uh, you can go there. You can engage in a discovery call. Uh, set up a discovery call where we will talk through and see if coaching is a good fit for you based on where you are in your journey. Uh, You can order the book there. You can order it through Amazon uh, or any place that online where you buy books. Um, The the goal is to to help leaders get better intentionally. That's that's why I started Catalytic Leadership. That's why I wrote the book. Uh, That's why I do the coaching because I want to see leaders get better. And so if that's where you are and you say, I want 2022 to be different. I want it to be better than 2021 was in 2020 and back. Great. Then, then I think you're a prime candidate for this. I think that, that you're ready to take your next step in your journey. Let's go. I'm ready to help you. I want to be on team you. Nice. And um, I know some people are like, okay, well, going back to your quote, mm-hmm. you know, just yeah. the fact that, okay, well, it's got to be better because it can't get a lot worse. But the problem is we know that, <laughs> but the problem is we know Careful. The, uh, there's a caveat. I was going to say the problem is we're not done with the broadcast yet. The problem is we all know, yes, it can. <laughs> it can. <laughs> I, I joke in all foolishness aside, I've, all, I've said this for years. So this isn't particular to any or particular person or, you know, caveat, caveat, caveat. But I always used to joke about uh, and I just told you, how do you get people super excited about paying five dollars a gallon for gas? Mm. <laughs> I don't know how. It's actually fairly easy. I'll give you another chance. Take one guess. How do you get people just jazzed up and super excited about paying five dollars a gallon for gas? <laughs> uh, cut the price from ten dollars a gallon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, you had the the prices at ten dollars a gallon for two or three years, and then they're yeah. jumping up and down out of their skin when it comes back mm. down to five. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of things that's relative and is perspective. Yeah, on that's good on where we're at, and so like I said, I've been saying it long before the gas prices are actually really close to five dollars a gallon now, depending on what part of the country you're at <laughs> here in the yeah, United States. Right. And we do have a lot of listeners in the UK, and and I'm sorry, you. you Petrol prices have been through the roof for ages long ago, but uh, here, here in the land of relatively cheap energy, uh, <laughs> when it's not, <laughs> we get upset about it. But uh, but saying that, there is it's, it's something to be said about, you know, it's, it's all, it's relative, you know, so how do you, it's better. Well, what's better? Well, how do you define better? You know, is it, hey, I'm paying five a gallon. Well, that's awful when you were paying a buck 50. It's awesome when you were paying 10. Absolutely. Just a matter of your perspective and kind of where you're at. That's a good point. So I was going to say, what do you think are some other strategies that leaders can take being that, you know, we're going through what year two, (laughs) (laughs) we've finished up two years in this and um, 
I was going to say, as we're approaching, you know, in the first part of 2022, you know, what would you give folks as a strategy to, um, to take and run with, to try to improve in 2022? You know, I think it, I think it's so important not to lose sight of the last key that I mentioned, which is leading yourself well. Okay. You know, it's, it's so easy, I think, for a leader to put that on the back burner and say, hey, I'll, I'll get to my own internal leadership later. I need to focus on the mission. I need to focus on the organization, the business. I need to focus on, you know, new client acquisition or dealing with this annoying team member or this problematic person, right? And, and we can focus on the externals like that. And we put our own self-leadership in the background. Mm. Uh, and if you do that long enough, I think what, what happens is that, that you will handicap your leadership going forward. Uh, you, will, you will limit your capacity. You will limit your influence. You will limit what could be uh, because you haven't taken the time to do the self-leadership work that really we all have to do. This is, this is not optional for any growing leader. It's funny you said something that kind of resonated. You're like, what could be? Yeah. Now, here's the, the reason I say that's kind of funny and not necessarily in a ha-ha funny kind of way is the fact that a lot of folks don't know what could have been. Yeah. They know what it is. Here's what it is. And it hasn't really changed. It hasn't got better. It hasn't got worse. We're just muddling along. We're sustaining. You know, we're, we're meeting our goals, so to speak. We're doing what we need to do. You know, so, but they don't know what could have been. And so you're like, well, hey, this is what you missed out on. Well, a lot of folks may not have that internal uh, uh, introspection on figuring out, well, this is where I wanted to go. This is where I could have been. This is where my goals were to go. They hit that plateau and they're just happy to stay there. So it's funny because how do you get folks to realize the difference between good enough and what could have been in that gap? Mm. <laughs> You know, in, in the context that I serve and lead in right now in the local church, uh, I will often say that excellence, not perfection, excellence honors God and inspires other people. Mediocrity does neither. If True that. Settle, All right. I, I like that. If, if we settle for mediocrity, if we settle for just kind of, you know, going along, just keep the boat going, uh, and, and we settle for good enough being good enough. Yes. Um, we will get results commensurate with that. I'll throw one I don't more. Know, I don't know a leader who's excited about that, honestly. I don't no. know a leader who's like, man, that's, I'm just, I'm just after good enough. That's, that's my dream. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you what, let me throw one at you and see what yeah. you think. Yeah. Well, there's, Excellence. Now, like I said, not perfection. So you kind of yeah. half answered the question, right? But there's a lot of folks that sometimes it's done is better than perfect. You know, and you think done is better than perfect. And sometimes in the striving for excellence, which they're maybe thinking of as perfection. Yeah. But in that striving for excellence to make it as good as it could possibly get, you know, they end up with the paralysis by analysis, they end up with the inaction, the procrastination, and it that your point on basically that propensity for action doesn't happen because we're striving for excellence. And sometimes the question I would have is sometimes it's done better than perfect. It's sometimes good enough, good enough for now mm -hmm. for a such particular situation, but not as a habit. What are your thoughts? You know, I think, I think Seth Godin speaks so well to this. Uh, in his books. And he talks about the importance of, at a certain point, you just have to ship, you know, you just yeah. have to ship the product, right? You can't keep fine tuning it and, and polishing it and making it better and better. Sometimes you just have to ship. There comes a point where it doesn't matter like as much that it's perfect as that it's out in the world <laughs> doing yes. what it's designed to do. And that is, that is so important. And, and I love what you're saying there, because I think that does matter. And we can get frozen by excellence. And, and that's why I'm so important. I'm, I'm so, I'm, I, I'm so intentional about saying excellence, not perfection. Yes. If we strive for perfection, we will never get there. Okay. You're not going to hit perfection. 
There's never going to be a moment where you feel like this thing could not be improved anymore. This product, this, this, whatever could not be improved anymore. Never get there. I don't know a creator worth their salt who ever thinks that what they have created is perfect. Well, and sometimes I think you to come a point where it's time to go. (laughs) Yes. And sometimes you now, granted, I'm saying this with the caveat that we're all not Microsoft. Okay, we yes. can't get our customers to beta test everything for us as a final version, right? So we get yes. that. They're bad about that a lot of times. Oh, we'll fix it with an update later. Yeah. But sometimes you don't know what you don't know until you get it out in the world and you get some real customer feedback. That's it. That's exactly. That's, this is the reason I didn't write this book 15 years ago. You know, because I wanted to test these principles. I wanted to test these keys and see if this was in fact true. And, and, and it has gotten better, to be sure, over time, as I've interacted with actual clients, actual leaders, help leaders get better, right? Nice. And that's the beauty of that. But there comes a point where it's time to go. You got to launch it. You got to say it's time to go. You cannot let the go. perfect be the enemy of the great, as yes. Collins says well. I love Jim Collins' quote on that, and we will end on that because you are absolutely right. You cannot let... You know, good become the uh, great become the enemy of good. It's just one of those you cannot can't put that off because at some point nothing will get done and you'll be stuck, and that is not a good place to, to be. So I want to thank you again for being on conversations on leadership with Dr. Dave. And if you want to reach out to Dr. Edway, please catalyticleadership.net. The .net part is pretty important. So catalyticleadership.net. Look him up on LinkedIn. Also. Uh, for our listeners, too, we always throw out, uh, if you text the letter COL for Conversations on Leadership to 540-900-0450, you'll get a lot of listener resources, getting insights on your team, some assessment tools. You'll get a lot of listener resources for the Conversation on Leadership listeners. So text COL for Conversations on Leadership to 540-900-0450, and we will see you next time on Conversations on Leadership with Dr. Dave here on KLDR Online Radio. Take care.